Hello, good morning, everybody, and welcome to this seminar. Um, I'm going to explain briefly the mechanics of how we're going to operate today, and then we're going to start with a brief introduction of, of uh, each and every one of our speakers. Uh, first, we're going to begin with this first block of introduction from our uh, speakers that we already read their bios. Then we're going to have a second block to answer the questions designated for this panel. And then we're going to have a third section or a third block for the question and answers where we will invite our audience to send questions using the platform's chat that you'll have there in your, your platform. So um, to begin with, uh, let me just uh, um, give a, share with us who's, who's going to be joining us for this panel. We have Rosalinda Torres from Inteva, Mexico, Director of Operations. We have um, Oscar Albin, Mexican from the Mexican Association of Auto Parts, uh, Automotive Parts Manufacturers, INA, Executive President. And uh, third, we have Carlos Gomez from uh, Continental Purchasing SQM Director. Now, uh, to begin with the uh, presentations, I'm going to explain briefly uh, from my side. I'm Managing Director Juan Vasquez, uh, pleasure to meet you all, uh, from INDEX. INDEX is a national association where we basically group all the uh, manufacturing for export industry that share the IMEX program. We are uh, basically in uh, the main auto, uh, manufacturing sector. We have automotive, auto parts, electric, electronics, aerospace, medical equipment, home appliances, agro-industry, food and beverages, textile and garments, and jewelry. We are located throughout the entire country, basically concentrated in the northern border, but uh, recently with very high growth in the center of Mexico and the uh, western side of Mexico. And we also have some uh, industry in the Yucatan Peninsula. Next, please. Uh, the IMEX industry employs 17% of the total formal labor in Mexico. The, 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 those are the jobs that are registered before the IMS. Um, from June to August, uh, we have recovered more than 67,000 employment uh, from the more than 100,000 uh, formal employments that we lost in, uh, in, in the previous months. Uh, and IMEX are the main generators of foreign capital for Mexico. Next. We have uh, approximately 6,500 uh, AMEX establishments. Um, this include also service companies. And we generate almost 3 million direct jobs. The average income is a little bit higher than 17,000 pesos per month. And we export uh, from 20 to $21 uh, million dollars per month. And this is after lockdown. The basic challenges currently are the uh, uh, USMCA adjustments. Uh, investments, foreign direct investments in coming to Mexico, and the outsourcing uh, um, regulations that are close to changing. Then uh, we also are facing right now some challenges with VAT and local customs national regulations, and we're going to be talking about some of those issues in the next uh, questions. I'm going to be sharing you my uh, contact information. If you have any questions or wish to contact Index, we are more than glad to be uh, of service. And now um, I'm going to introduce, we're going to begin with Rossi, uh, you please, uh, so you can explain a little bit of, of, of your company. Thank you. Okay, I'm going to talk to you about Intiva product. I am a director of operations um, for the plants in Mexico. Can you go ahead and go to the next slide, please? Uh, as I said, Intiva is a customer driven global supplier of engineering components and system for the automotive industry has been actually alive since 2007. Our product line includes closure systems, interior systems, and motors and electronics. And we have more than 100 customers, including virtually all of the world's uh, leading global and regional automakers. Intiva is a tier one, two, and three supplier. Intiva Mexico has uh, five facilities uh, with, uh, as I said before, close to 5,000 employees. We have uh, three plants uh, in Matamoros, Tamaulipas, which is the border with the uh, USA. Uh, we have one plant in Silao, Guanajuato, in Puerto Interior, uh, close to one of our biggest uh, customers, General Motors. And we have one technical center in Ciudad Juarez. Um, uh, we're gonna have a, a new plant very soon. I cannot talk about it yet, but it will be very soon in Matamoros. 
Now, uh, as far as the product line for interiors, uh, the plant in Guanajuato and two of the plants in Matamoros, their main products are instrument panels, consoles, glove boxes, doors, and motors. The main processes for interiors are injection molding, vinyl and TPO extrusion, leather coating, wrapping, sewing, thermoforming, and paint. The main processes for motors are magnetizing, welding, motor wiring, and component assembly. For the closures product lines, we do have only one plant in Mexico, it is in Matamoros, and the products uh, related to this product line are latches, window regulators, door handles, and door modules. The main processes for this uh, product line are stamping, fine blanking, over molding, welding, heat treat, and final assembly. This is a little bit of our customers, main customers in Mexico. You can take a look at it. And finally, about our suppliers, our suppliers are all over the world. Uh, for Mexico, 75% are from US, 5% uh, Canada, 12, it's actually 12 to 15% in Mexico, and 8% are overseas. And this is in Tiba. Thank you. Thank you very much, Rosalinda. Now, uh, going to Oscar, please. Thank you, Juan. Uh, uh, hi, I am Oscar Alvin, a president of the uh, um, National Auto Part Association. Uh, very quick, um, I'm going to be shorter than my predecessors. Please, next. The um, uh, National Auto Part uh, represent all the manu auto part manufacturers in Mexico with the federal government with the academia and with the society in general. We have uh, members from uh, different places around the world established in Mexico, and we work very close with other automotive associations in Mexico, like uh, light duty vehicles, heavy duty vehicles, dealers, and also with all um, other uh, auto part association around the world from America, Asia, and Europe. Next. They are in Mexico just for uh, uh, you to know, uh, like uh, 600 tier one suppliers that are established and supplying to the uh, uh, different OEMs, mainly in North America, that is Canada, US, and Mexico, and also for light duty as uh, heavy duty vehicles. And we have identified uh, close to 900 tier twos and tier threes suppliers established in Mexico. So in total, close to 1500 manufacturing locations dedicated to the auto parts in Mexico border to border. Thank you. Thank you, Oscar. Now we go with you, Carlos. Thank you, Juan. Uh, I hope that everyone in the audience is doing okay at this moment, stay safe and healthy. I mean, while my presentation appears, um, I've been in this industry for more than 20 years on the automotive sector, uh, but uh, I work for Continental since uh, probably that time and also work for uh, different other associations in here. So Continental is a company well established here in Mexico uh, please go to the next. Uh, we've been in. We are going to be celebrating also our 150th anniversary in the next uh, in the next uh, year uh, as a company globally. So our sales are uh, 44.5 billion of uh, euros in sales. Uh, we host 241,000 employees globally, and also we have uh, 595 sites. Uh, all of those are in located or distributed among to 59 countries. And uh, this is more or less the percentage of sales for the different divisions. Uh, mostly our company start uh, selling tires and uh, rubber products, uh, nevertheless, uh, based on the new technologies and diversification of the market. So we have an end of uh, going on the chassis and safety business, powertrain and also interior. Uh, next one, please. 
So uh, as I described it uh, previously, uh, the business areas are more or less uh, divided in three, in three large divisions, the automotive technology, which uh, hosts the autonomous mobility and safety, the AMS, and vehicle networking and information technology in there. So these are uh, more or less focused on interior parts and instrument panels and also brakes uh, any type of electronic controls needed uh, uh, for, for, uh, for a car and a truck also as well, and also to produce uh, the most high-tech uh, panels for, for, the, for the industry. The rubber technologies goes uh, from the tires and Contitech divisions. Into this, uh, we all know that we have tires as well, and also we have horses, bands uh, for transportation, and all the related uh, um, products uh, for rubber technologies. Uh, we also have another division, which is uh, powertrain technologies, uh, which is recently named as Avitesco Technology. This company is more referring to the powertrain and engine uh, control units. And nowadays they are going to be shifting to, uh, to the new technologies of electric cars on the powertrain area. Next one, please. So our footprint uh, in Mexico, uh, we have a re really good presence in Mexico. We host and employ 26,000 employees in, in Mexico, divided in 24 locations. We don't only do um, production. We also are having two really good sites of uh, R&D, one located in Guadalajara and another one located in Querétaro, which host more than 2,500 engineers in to these two locations developing uh, new technologies and developing new trends of, uh, of uh, products that will be produced in the near future. And uh, as you can see in the right, right hand side, uh, for the automotive division, we have a plenty uh, quantity of footprint uh, of, and also in the, in the powertrain area and also tires and also Contitec. And this is all for my side and uh, wishing you a good uh, time during this, uh, during this conversation. Thank you very much, Carlos. Now, uh, we're going to begin with the second block, which is going to be the questions for our panelists. And we begin with um, our first question, which is going to be for Rosalinda. Um, SAT authorities published earlier this year the elimination of benefits that were granted to EVA or VAT certified companies, as well as other benefits that were important for manufacturing operations. How do you see Mexico's competitiveness in the near future compared to today? Okay, uh, thank you, Juan. Uh, well, uh, this um, has been something that uh, is not good. Because of the elimination of these benefits, the process to get the um, EVA back has been very um, painful, lengthy. And really, uh, we believe in, the intention is, um, is um, the SAT want to keep it. Companies are going through that process and it requires a lot of detailed information and time. And they are also conducting very detailed audits. And if SAT finds something, they will issue fine. We're talking millions of dollars that now are not being reimbursed as expected on time. Um, in our case, uh, we did it, we were successful, <clears throat> but only once. I mean, this, is, this has to happen over and over again. We have to do it every time. The situation is not good. The companies, um, as you know, base the decision and their operating budget based on the existing rules and conditions. This changing of the rules in the middle of the game create an impact that is not easy to compensate. Unfortunately, for the automotive industry being so competitive, uh, our margins are not that big. This is very bad news. Hopefully, the Mexican government will create the right conditions to favor the investment in Mexico, uh, like uh, low, lower interest rate, certainty, transparency, clear rules that do not change over year, et cetera, in order to uh, motivate the investment and recover the employment loss during this year and to have a sustained growth. Otherwise, uh, we can have very complicated scenarios. Thank you, Rosalinda. And talking about authorities, um, Oscar, uh, 
do you, do you expect right now a better or a worse situation for the auto parts industry in Mexico with incoming President Biden taking power in the U.S.? And please explain why do you believe this? Thank you, Juan. Uh, let me let me let me say this: uh, the auto parts sector in Mexico, ninety percent of uh, uh, his pro that that production is going to. United States and Canada to be placed in a, in a factory of a new car or trucks. So basically we are in Mexico manufacturing auto parts for the um, manufacturing of cars and trucks in the United States. Car and trucks in the United States are manufacturing there because it's a big market and the market is going to be as good as the economy in the United States is good. Uh, in the la in the in the in the last four four years that is uh, with the president Trump, the economy in the United States, not considering this year obviously, but it was very good. It was very good in in terms of economy, in terms of incoming, and with the with the, um, a general rule of uh, reducing taxes, reducing taxes for the. Um, individuals as as well as the as the companies that create a lot of good faith for um, buying new cars. And today, it's a it's a uh, the the people in the United States is hungry to buy new cars, including bigger cars, pickups, SUVs. So everything is 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 doing well in that term. With the with the with Mr. Biden uh, going to be president. We believe that the economy in the United States will continue strong. The uh, 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 Wall Street is strong in some way. We are in the phase out uh, for the COVID condition. So definitely um, uh, Biden or any other one, the economy in the United States is strong and that is in consequence uh, a, a good opportunity to continue buying cars, manufacturing cars, and manufacturing auto parts for those cars. So everything is going to be equal or better, definitely, no problem. That, that's very good news, Oscar. And right now that you mentioned about uh, COVID, uh, Carlos, what problems do you foresee for your industry two years from now? And how is the current COVID pandemic affecting this environment? So Juan, that's a very good question. I think we all in the call are facing uh, some economical problems, number one, and some other um, COVID situations. I think the success here will be for the companies that are going to be able to manage strongly their assets, uh, to manage strongly the productivity in order to don't go for uh, bankruptcy. Uh, and also the other thing is uh, for those companies are going to be successful, the ones that are able to manage the pandemic. In terms of uh, healthiness control, safety, uh, security and uh, into their plants, um, just to avoid the, con the contagious of, uh, of the virus among to, their, um, uh, to our employees. Uh, meanwhile, the vaccine is not completely developed or uh, implemented in all, the, in all the citizens among to the US or Mexico. So the companies have to be the leaders into to see how can they manage and control the, the, the pandemic being spread among it to the production lines. So just a, as an example, uh, some companies are facing the situation that and a person comes inside uh, infected and you didn't have the controls. So you have to retrieve all the people back home. Meanwhile, you sanitize all your location and also to see to whom was spread this, this virus. So the challenge here is to continue working on the preventive side, number one, and also the challenge will be to, to get a good economical healthiness into your company and into here also the governments for the three uh, countries that uh, belong to this uh, free trade agreement are able to support uh, the, the companies in, into, into the economical portion giving them some incentives and, and also supporting uh, the economy side. So these are the two elements that I foresee that could be a risk, 
but uh, in the other side, the positive uh, news will be how can we manage these uh, these two um, difficulties and in, into the future. All right. So those are my my comments. Thank you, Carlos. And right now, talking about productivity and challenges, uh, Rossi, what are the current challenges for education within your industry? How does this differ from other markets uh, in Mexico? And what is your opinion on possible actions that can be taken to attend these challenges? Okay, education, um, it's, um, education and training are, are basic for our industry in Mexico. Uh, for many, many years, we have been working very close with the uh, education institutions in, uh, in our cities mainly. Uh, technical schools, universities, and technological institutes uh, to even have influence in the type of education um, that we need for, our, for the students that in the future uh, will be our employees. And, and then we also have agreements to have them finalize their education in our plans. So we have been working, doing a lot of this, and this uh, has been uh, a very successful uh, strategy uh, for our industry. We also invest in the training of our people in our specific technologies, and of course, also in uh, leadership and development. Our current challenge um, is that uh, we probably are not going as fast as the technology is developing. Nowadays, it is more global, more diverse, and it's uh, changing for continuous improvement, and it's changing because our customers are also also demanding new technology in the products. We have equipment supplier of key equipment all over the world, and it takes some time to transfer the knowledge, uh, the, not only the knowledge, but the experience uh, quick enough. I understand that other markets are also having this difficulty. Uh, markets with lower levels of new technology might not, have, might not be having this, this challenge. Um, so, in my opinion, we need to continue investing in educating our people as the technology develop uh, so we can be ready on time, but also I believe that we can have some of our global uh, equipment suppliers localized to Mexico in order to provide technical support and training services. Some of them are already doing it, and I know they are growing, and, and it's, it's going well. uh, that's, that's my opinion. Thank you. Thank you, Rossi. And uh, talking about competitiveness, uh, Oscar, uh, will North America, Mexico included, continue to be as competitive as in recent years for the auto parts industry growth compared to other integrated regions in the world and why? Uh, thank you, Juan. Uh, let, uh, let us describe the other um, uh, automotive regions. First is Asia with uh, Japan, Korea, and China as a main man. OEM manufacturer, and they have many, many uh, low cost countries opportunities to get parts. That is Vietnam, Thailand, Malaysia, Philippines, China itself. So they are many, many different options. So they are competing each other all the time to be competitive. In Europe, that is the cars that is manufactured in Germany, France, Spain, Great, Great Britain, Italy, it is, uh, they have many other uh, oil, uh, countries around that can supply auto parts like uh, Hungary, Poland, Czech Republic, some other Eastern Europe countries, Turkey, Tunisia, Morocco. So they, they, they have many options and they are competing and and getting better every other day. Canada and United States, they have Mexico and only Mexico. We don't have competitors and we are in a, in a comfort zone. If we continue in the comfort zone without competitors for supply auto parts to United States, someday we are going to, to, to uh, we are uh, uh, losing competitiveness with the changes in the in the uh, uh, export rules, like uh, Rossi uh, just mentioned before about the uh, the SAT, EVA, and many other ones, so 
we are losing every other day competitiveness versus other countries in Asia or in Europe. So if we don't see that we are uh, a losing competitiveness and we continue to be in our comfort zone, one day we are going to start losing components going to Asia or going to Morocco or going to some other place, even, even South America, like a Colombia. And, uh, and, and we have to be uh, alert that we are not alone. So in conclusion, we are losing competitiveness with, um, we are, the industry is very strong and we are always trying to be competitive itself from our fence to inside. In Diva, Continental, they are always, all day, uh, a continuous improvement. But if from the fence to outside, apparently everybody's trying to, to, to place a, a hole on obstacle, the industry whole is losing competitiveness. That's my, my point of view. Thank you, Oscar, uh, and very interesting. Uh, before continuing, we're going to have a brief message from our organizers. Okay, now uh, coming back to what Oscar was uh, explaining right now about competitiveness, uh, fence in and then fence out. Uh, our next question is going to Carlos uh, related to competitiveness. Mexico has had challenges to find competitive suppliers in Mexico, especially when you go down to tier two, tier three or tier four levels or to develop Mexican companies to supply the international auto parts industry located in Mexico or outside. What would your advice be to Mexican companies that want to become these suppliers? That's a good question, Juan, thank you. Um, I think uh, the, the, the first uh, recommendation will be, um, again, to, to manage properly the, the, the pandemic situation at this moment. Uh, the second recommendation will be to focus on quality. W w Mexico has, has been um, a good, a good example of a good quality products. So the bar is, is quite high and we need to sustain it. So, so it's clear. And, and uh, my third advice will be uh, to focus on new technologies. Um, and uh, so once you have the maturity in one technology, let's focus on the new trends coming in. Um, practically, we are looking for uh, a new technologies coming for, for the electrical cars. Uh, electric cars, cars in the future will play a big role. Um, I know Mexico or probably in the US uh, is still a long way to go to get this implemented. But the first companies uh, that uh, 
enter into this market are the ones that are going to be successful in the future. Why? Because they will have the technology, they will have the money to continue investing into, into these new technologies and, um, and also to, to be part of this grow on these new trends that we have at this moment to protect our environment. And um, another advice that probably ca can, be, can be focused on this is um, associate with the companies in among other, uh, other, other parts of, of the globe. Why? Because they can be probably healthy in terms of financial. We have, uh, we have the near shore to the, to the big market, which is the US. And also you can diversify the product portfolio and diversify the customer portfolio as well that can help you out uh, to have a very a good uh, technology absorbing from your motherhood company. And the other side will be to get uh, the monetary uh, support from this uh, central company. So all this together can bring you good quality, good technology, good uh, economy healthiness into here, and also uh, good, uh, good um, penetration into the new era of uh, electric cars. So that will be my, my recommendations. Obviously we have uh, challenges, uh, it's clear. I mean, so the challenges are among all the taxes related coming from parts from, from uh, different countries that we have to finally assemble and send it back to the US. Uh, number one, uh, taxes that are imposed for parts that are coming from China. The, this will be a benefit for us because we can um, access to a different tax uh, um, regulations in here, but it will not be for, for, uh, for a temporary manner. So we have to be competitive also into our processes. So therefore, uh, here are the recommendations. Uh, I'm looking forward for questions at, at the end. And um, thank you, Juan, for, for, for asking this question. Thank you, Carlos. Uh, very interesting uh, for the advice and for the near future. Uh, but coming back to the present, I want to ask Rossi, what are the lessons learned from this pandemic for next years and what are the permanent changes for the industry? Uh, well, I, I don't think we have learned everything that we have to about this pandemic and this virus. We're still learning. Um, there are many lessons learned so far. And I can say that from our government, not only the Mexican government, I think every country went through the same ordeal, some more than others, um, from the industry, from the people, from ourselves. I believe from the government, and I'm going to focus in Mexico, um, our, our health system was, was not ready and is not, is inefficient. Uh, hospitals, medicine, lack of medicine, uh, medical personnel, protective equipment. Uh, obviously we were not ready. And even when we had some time to prepare, um, we lose some um, precious time uh, back then in the beginning of the year. Um, also considering education in general in, in the uh, population in Mexico, because our um, um, eating and, and hygiene habits are not good, and that's part of the education that we owe to, to the population. Um, we, um, as you know, you know, we have many health issues and, and it's related mainly to, to that. And of course, the economy was severely affected. There was no plan for this contingency. And basically we stopped everything, in my opinion, too soon and affected a lot uh, the industry. Um, we are now going back to what we call the second wave and uh, it looks like we have not learned uh, everything. So um, of course, you know, the government or the people was not ready for, you know, going through this. Um, the economic, um, uh, the economy was, was severely affected in all sectors. From the industry, I can say basically we went through the same. Our plans were not ready. We believed that um, we thought we were doing the right thing, taking care of our people. And at the end, we found out we were not because we do have people that have problems and we were not doing anything to prevent this. Of course, we have learned and we are now doing, uh, 
what we what we um what we need to do. What are the permanent changes? Um, our plants are not the same. Our plant has changed, you know, uh, physically. Um, we have modified, as everybody has, to comply with uh, the social distancing. And our, um, our habits are different now. We are trying to educate our people. We, we're trying to monitor their health. The medical department is more visible now, probably everywhere. And um, even our new, new uh, processes, our new lines that are being designed, developed, are taking into consideration social distancing. Uh, yes, we know there is a vaccine in, in the way, but um, still, you know, this changed our lives. Uh, and, and I think some of the things are, are going to stay there. Okay, uh, thank you, Rosie. And uh, coming back to you, Oscar, and talking about a, a very hot topic right now. Currently, uh, federal authorities are immersed in heavy discussions around insourcing and outsourcing abolition for personnel. What consequences do you foresee for the Mexican industry, especially if this industry has to compete with other markets that allow these labor relations? We have to understand and recognize that the outsourcing uh, rules or law, it was established by uh, President uh, Calderón at the end of uh, his uh, period. And, uh, and even President Peña announced it as a reforma laboral, reform, a labor reform. Right now, the only thing that the government is doing is, is, is time to place it and, and approve it and, and run it. So it should not be a surprise for the um, uh, um, economic sectors, private sectors, that the outsourcing, it was going to change. It's not a surprise. And if it's not a surprise for someone, it's, it's incredible because it's, it's been in the law for many, many years. Now, what we are trying to do is moving and pushing back the implementation time because the government wants uh, January 1st, that finally is not going to happen. It's going to be at the Congress at the beginning of next year. And potentially we are trying to, to be implemented uh, starting 2022. Talking about insourcing, insourcing is basically a mechanism to reduce the um, a profit sharing to the employees. So uh, the companies place that um, uh, uh, mechanism to reduce the profit sharing in most of the, most of the cases. And uh, with that, the, we consider that the way to, for the industry, for the, for the economic sectors to be um, safe on that is to the government accept to have a top limit on the uh, profit sharing for the employees. If that is a, a, a standard rule, I, I believe the insourcing is not going to have a consequence. Um, right now, we are in dialogue with the government to implement these uh, different rules with very uh, light consequence for the industry in particular. Automotive industry use a lot of outsourcing. It is important to understand that the outsourcing is going to be prohibited into if it's happening into your core business. And uh, now what is important is to define what is your core business. That is going to be a, a, a big uh, uh, impact. Now, talking about how we compare with some other uh, uh, markets, regions, and some other com uh, low competitive countries, as I mentioned before, we are losing competitiveness versus some other uh, real uh, competitors like uh, Vietnam, Thailand, uh, Malaysia, China, uh, even at the south of the United States. So uh, if we continue doing all these uh, different obstacles to be competitive, we are going to continue losing competitiveness. Now, the outsourcing model of the shelter model that it was using outsourcing, it was a magnificent, a, a magnificent uh, program 
to provide soft landing for foreign direct investment. The, the shelter, they land, they start producing, they know how to produce, but they don't, they don't know how to deal with the different Mexican rules. And with the time they are going to be um, in, including the activities into their own uh, uh, core business. It was great. And it's been using in the last uh, 40 years uh, uh, with a big success. Uh, and it, it, it was for soft landing, uh, for indirect investment. If we don't have that in the future, this, the, the, the foreign direct investment is going to be more difficult to attract. So yeah, we are losing competitiveness, as I mentioned, from the fence of the companies to outside. Thank you, Juan. We have another question for Carlos, uh, recapping on what we've talked about, competitiveness, lessons learned, what we need to do, advice. Um, in past years, we saw a fast growth in the Mexican auto part and uh, automotive and auto part industry. Do you expect such growth in the near future post pandemic and why? Well, um, it will be depending on uh, many external factors. I mean, number one will be if, um, if we are able as a, as a globe to control the pandemic, uh, number one. And, and as Rosie mentioned also as well, uh, to, to share the best practice around and uh, to see how can we control it uh, into, into the country. Uh, number two will be the, the support as, as well from the government to, to kind of an, a guide the rest of the citizens uh, how to um, how to control this, this, this difficult situation. And uh, number three, I have to say that the, the grow might depend also on the companies that want to take the risk uh, on invest on new technologies. Uh, I think we have the majority of the technologies into the region, a uh, couple of spots uh, in there, but uh, uh, will be good to see the migration of, of high-end technologies, I think. We have a qualified labor force in Mexico, and uh, we have a good quality uh, in terms of the products that we produced, and uh, also will be uh, good to see uh, more companies from, uh, from China or from uh, Europe coming and invest in Mexico and enjoy the beauty of, uh, of, uh, of this, of this uh, uh, qualified labor force around in, in, into Mexico. So, so in, in, in a short time period, I don't think that we will see a big growth, uh, but in the long run, I think, I think it could be a, a, good, uh, a good growth, uh, again, depending on, on this specific niche of market that is coming for, uh, for the next generation of uh, mobility cars, next generation of, uh, of energy, energy management, and also the next generation of, uh, of, um, of communications that are going to be around uh, the cars, uh, more for the safety, more for the um, auto, auto cars, uh, auto, auto managed cars, uh, more out, uh, more into, into this direction, more in the, into the electronics, into the electronics arena. So that will be, that will be my, my, my comment. Um, uh, let's keep it positive. I mean, we have the talent, we have uh, the nature, we have the opportunity in terms of taxes. If, uh, if the government also help us out on this to be more competitive, but we also have to be uh, competitive into our processes. I mean, uh, I think, uh, uh, all, the, all the people in the panel has this cause of competitiveness and, and it's good to keep it uh, in there. I think uh, that should be from my side, Juan. Thank you, Carlos. And now this question is going to be for everybody in our panel. Um, what are the opportunities that you can envision for companies that want to enter Mexico or for investors that want to start up a new company in Mexico? Uh, what are those opportunities that you see for the auto part industry in the near future? Where should they invest? Uh, let's start with uh, Rosalinda. Uh, thank you, Juan. Well, I think um, there are many opportunities since uh, many OEMs are now in Mexico and some of them expanding. Um, R2Part, R2Part uh, industry, 
industry uh, can take advantage of this uh, growing market and look at localizing wherever possible. Um, for this, of course, we need to compete. Um, it is important to stay competitive, maintain great levels of customer satisfaction. Um, that's always the case, you know, and name it quality, delivery, and cost. So that's the name of the game. Thank you, Rosalinda. Oscar, what are those uh, specific opportunities that you see? Well, uh, Mexico had uh, offer a different, uh, always an opportunity in different way uh, for different invest investors. Right now, our biggest competitor in North America is the South of the United States. And why? Because they have a very good tax incentives. Also, the energy power costs half of what happened in Mexico. And, uh, and they have a good labor, not as complicated with unions as the North. So if your company needs uh, intensive labor and also high quality product that is, is that will require a, a, a good a, a, a quality like a like a, a finish and uh, that kind of things and it's not intensive in capital I think uh, Mexico has a good opportunity to be the best choice in North America remember that North America with the new USMCA in the in the in the automotive sector, North America is for North America. We will not like components coming from Europe or components coming from Asia. That is the, the name of the game. So many Europeans or Asian manufacturers, tier two, tier threes, will have to come to North America because the uh, requirement from the OEMs and tier ones. So I think that the choice is going to be where? Between South of the United States or Mexico. And that is going to be the, um, uh, the big uh, difference. But the, I think uh, the USMCA is working well, or is going to work very well uh, in favor of Canada, US, and Mexico. And that is going to be the big uh, uh, trigger uh, for companies to come. Thank you, Oscar. And Carlos, what are those opportunities that you see? Well, I see opportunities on different commodities. I will just name one. Batteries will be one. Uh, motors will be another one. Um, more into the powertrain uh, topic, uh, all the products that are related to powertrain. Uh, so those are, those are the, the niche that you can see into the, into the uh, long run future because it will be a, an establishment on that also. Uh, remember, those new cars will need some energy and some uh, connections. Also, the, the, the areas where you can recharge your batteries and uh, also will be we also need it. Um, I mean, we are far away of having in Mexico this type of, uh, of things. Uh, if, if, uh, if, if we don't uh, introduce them faster. So that will be depending on how, how the trends are coming here into Mexico, number one, how accessible are in terms of price to the population, number two, and uh, how accessible is the, the way that you can charge your battery and how fast can you charge your batteries into, into the new technologies. So that will be the area. The other, uh, the other topic will be uh, displays. I know it requires a lot of uh, asset management in there. Uh, PCBs also requires a lot of asset management. Uh, everyone is going to need a, need a PCB. Uh, and, and also electronic components are quite complex because uh, they, they need a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, front end and back end uh, processes that uh, will take a lot of time and a lot of investment. Uh, and at the end, to, to, to manufacture an electronic components uh, requires uh, different sites with different technologies and different uh, applications, but at least uh, possibility to invest into the into one of the processes from uh, from uh, from electronics will be also an opportunity. That should be my my participation into this question. Okay, Juan, Juan yes. I would like to add uh, what Carlos is saying because uh, he's yes, 
mention many, many uh, components, but I will add a tool, tools and dice. That is a, a industry that uh, is still very, very low in Mexico compared to mm -hmm. countries. But in this case, we need um, a, a work together with the academia, with the government, and with the uh, um, industry. Because when you ask a tool maker in Canada to produce a tool in Mexico, they said, well, it's going to be more expensive because I don't have a tool makers in Mexico. I, I will have to bring one from Canada, expat them and train a new tool maker for the next two years. And your tool is going to be more expensive. And, uh, and, and, and this is like a dog and tile. Why we don't have uh, tool makers in Mexico? Because we don't have the industry. So it is, it is a, a, a something that the government has to in, uh, have an uh, interest to kind of uh, cooperate and subsidize some way on, on those new industry, like I used to be when you have, we want to bring uh, aeronautic uh, industry in Mexico. Well, it's a new industry, you have to invest, you have to provide a soft landing. The tool and, tool and dice is a new industry. It's in the, in the automotive, but not only in the automotive. It's uh, for many ones. And if we want that industry in Mexico, we have to invest and provide soft landing as a government for that new industry. So it's not easy. We have to work around. And I don't know if we are going to be success, but at, at least we have to try. So Juan, if I may also, there is a question from the audience about uh, what about the electronics that comes from Asia, from Asia will be opportunities for our local suppliers to develop? Uh, yes, we have a case of success for a company that produces capacitors, uh, have a footprint in uh, Monterey and also footprint Matamoros and footprint in, in the US. Um, it's a large company, it's a global company and has been proven that they can be successful in producing capacitors. Uh, so the, the technology is there, the, the skills are there from, the, from our people, and, uh, and also the trust is in there for, for the area. Uh, again, uh, the, the uh, state governments will play a big role in here uh, with the umbrella of, of, the, of, the of the Mexican government to see if they can provide more incentives to these new landing companies and, and, and generate this trust into the region to, to land th those companies into, into Mexico. Uh, it's a lot of work still, uh, but I think uh, can be achievable. Again, for, for microprocessors, for another type of more complex electronic components, is difficult. I mean, so uh, whatever company, you name it, uh, have uh, different processes located in, in, into different regions. I mean, they don't produce one solid electronic component like a microprocessor in one specific location. Um, the parts flow around the world for different uh, countries uh, to, to produce some different sub-processes. So the key here will be to find the right sub-process for these electronic components and start landing in here. Um, thank you. Thank you, Carlos. Now we're going to begin with our question and answer uh, section. Um, we have here one from Sergio Gonzalez asking, has any of you or your customers or related companies uh, within your organization, have, have you seen the ro relocalization of components from China to Mexico, the reshoring? Is, is this trend true? What can you say about this? Uh, I don't know who wants to raise the hand first. So I can share the microphone. I can I can I can add on this. Sure. If if you if I may. Um, so so yes, we have been uh, uh, we have seen a lot of success on on, on some cases. Again, uh, the the key element here will be to find the right partner here in Mexico. So if you are in a small company. Uh, Open your eyes. I mean, so participate on the forums, participate on the on on, on trips to to different regions on on the world, 
and see the possibility of merge with those companies. In that way, you can absorb uh, part of the technology, part of the economic uh, support from this uh, motherhood company, and also part of the customer portfolio. Um, we also have seen some cases with no good success that the company comes along here from, from different regions, from Asia or from Europe, and they don't have an, uh, an, a local partner that can introduce you to, uh, to the country and can get you uh, doing the crawling and then the, the running into the, into the business and also sharing the different, the different customers. They come just to serve one customer and this is not good. This doesn't generate competitiveness. So this, this will be my answer from my side and I leave it open for Ross yeah, and I for can, Oscar. I can add that uh, it is happening. In our case, we are doing some of that and um, it also has to do with the uh, cost of logistics, which is important. Okay. Uh, I will mention that uh, when, when the United States start placing some duties uh, uh, for their uh, products coming from China, it was a big um, uh, uh, hope that Mexico could uh, be the, um, uh, uh, the land for many Chinese companies, many, many. That didn't happen. That, that is, they are, some of them are coming, but not the, 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 the tens or hundreds that we were considering. Why is that? Because we were negotiating the free trade agreement, the new US, USMCA, and that took like a two years. So, and it was in parallel. So the Chinese companies, they said, okay, if I am going to Mexico, I am going to, it's, it's going to be sure that I am going to be able to export from Mexico to United States in a, in a, in a duty-free condition. No, because we are negotiating the USMCA, we, it's not finished. So they move to Taiwan, to Thailand, to Vietnam, and they are exporting now from there that they don't have those big um, a tariff going into United States. Just to have an idea, today, the auto parts going into United States outside China, going from Thailand, from Vietnam, from even Mexico without free trade agreement, the average uh, tariff between uh, the different uh, components is going from zero, there are many that are zero anyway, to 6%, the wire harness is 6%. So in average, it's like a 2%. So with 2%, that is it's out of part made in Taiwan, going to United States pay 2% on duty. So there is no, no, no big deal. The problem is China that has to pay 25%. So they move to those countries and they are exporting from there. So, uh, Today, if we go and knock the door to a Chinese company that is manufacturing aluminum wheels, delivering to United States that they were in China, now they have to pay 25%. Now they are producing them in Thailand. And that is a real case. And from Thailand, they have to pay 2%. So what is going to do United States to raise uh, uh, his uh, tariff income tariff to the rest of the world that they don't have a free trade agreement. That's a big, big question. And it was a big war and battle to be, to be held with the um, a, a World Trade Organization, the WTO and United States. And it was a pending fight from President Trump with them. What is our best uh, advantage and, and could be there if United States raised their tariff from outside NAFTA, that will be great for us. So, and then we are going to get incoming companies coming to Mexico, coming, going to the South of the United States because they, they, it, it, it will be very difficult to export to United States. So really the, 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 the problem here is that the, uh, the tariff going into the United States is very low today. Okay, thank you. And uh, related to this, uh, we have a question from the audience also asking which incentives from the government and from the market overall 
would you like to see improve in the manufacturing environment in Mexico in order to attract these kind of businesses? Uh, who would like to begin with this uh, answer? Um, let's come back to you, Oscar. You were talking about this right now. Die, mama mia. <laughs> what kind of incentives would you like Inci to see? Incent incentives. There, there is no incentives. This, this next four years is not going to be incentives. Forget it. I believe we should be copying what other countries are doing. And we, we have a chart, for example, that what are the uh, incentives that some other countries establish for research and development? My friend Carlos Gomez here from Continental. Continental have 2,000 engineers working in research and development in Mexico. And we don't provide any incentive. And if you want to establish a research and development center in some other countries, I will not mention names, but the incentive is even more than 100%. So even you are going to make money from incentives, having a research and development in that country. So it's incredible. We are not having a, a real soft land for incentives, uh, not, on, not only in manufacturing, also research and development. That is the key. That is, if you don't want to establish manufacturing, okay, that's fine. But research and development, really, it's incredible. Every country has some attractiveness for establish a research and development centers. And Mexico is like a crime to establish a, a research and development center. In Teba, they, you have a, a good research and development center in Ciudad Juarez. And it's 100% with your money, no incentive at all. So it, it, it's, it's, it should be reviewed at least for research and development. That's important for any country, especially for the next 10 years. Thank you, Juan. Okay, uh, Carlos, what's your opinion about this issue? Well, well, I have to say that um, I kind of convey with um, with um, with Oscar in, in some of his statements. Um, uh, I will incline more on taxes, uh, taxes regulation, so and also to facilitate uh, the 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 landing of the company with, with someone that can take you from uh, scratch to production. Um, this, uh, this could be a good incentive for, for motivating and other companies uh, to land in, 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 in Mexico. The other thing will be um, to, uh, I mean, I, I don't know if they will restart again, the Mexico, uh, the, the, the office of, of uh, of, uh, of, uh, of Mexico attractiveness and, and that we had in the past. Uh, it's, it's kind of a, a, a holding one situation to support uh, the, the, new, the new companies. And also our participation as, a, as, as industrials in the chambers to motivate our suppliers, to motivate another companies to land in here. Um, we have a good talent into the universities uh, there is one of the comments into the into the into the question and answer session that uh, shows that the Tech de Monterrey and another uh, universities have good talent to offer to these uh, to these new companies. Um, uh, again, the competitiveness with the U.S. with the south of the U.S. is that they are providing even the land to 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 invest into that area. Some tax incentives. Uh, we will not say that the, everything has to come from the government, but at least has to come from the from the um, local governments, uh, from the governors, number one, and also has to match with the at the beginning with some uh, tax ex exceptions. Um, meanwhile, the company ramps up and generates the credibility into Mexico. Hey, thank you, Carlos and uh, Ros Rosie, to close uh, with your comment on this issue. Yeah, I was going to say, yeah, mainly for new companies. Yeah, I think tax relief is be good. Um, but also, I think we need to, more than incentives, we need incentives, of course, but we also need uh, certainty and transparency. Like I was saying, you know, the changing of the rules is not good. 
And that's what's happening right now. Okay. That, of course, is not good for, for investors. Okay, well, thank you very much, uh, everybody, for your comments on today's panel. I think it was a very interesting discussion. Uh, some of what is going on in the current situation and what we can see, foresee for the future. Um, I would like to thank our panelists, Rossi, Oscar, and Carlos. From my side, it was a pleasure being with you. And uh, thank you very much. And have a good day, everybody.